Story 1 Night had already fallen when I found myself seated on the couch, staring blankly at the letter I had discovered in my mailbox. The soft cushions beneath me felt as hard as concrete, likely due to the tension knotting my muscles. The letter, from my grandfather with whom I'd long lost contact, was a mystery wrapped in an envelope. Despite an internal warning screaming not to, my hand clenched it tightly. Finally, unable to bear the suspense, I rose, placed the letter on the table, and drifted towards the kitchen for a drink. The refrigerator, when opened, presented a barren landscape, save for a couple of beer cans. A mental note to go grocery shopping flashed through my mind. Grabbing a can, I popped it open, the hiss breaking the eerie silence. I gulped it down in one go, relishing the brief escape it offered. Grabbing the second can, I wandered back to the living room. The house was well lit, but a chilling dread washed over me. The letter's potential revelations haunted me. I set the beer on my newly purchased coffee table and, with a deep breath, tore open the envelope. The letter was brief. An invitation from my grandfather to his remote country house for his 80th birthday. That was it. No queries, no warm wishes. Just a dry invitation. I read it again, searching for hidden messages, before crumpling it up and tossing it in the bin. Sinking back into the couch, I sighed heavily, lost in thought. Why now? What did my grandfather want from me? Was this a final reconciliation? Or something more? He was wealthy, but his money meant nothing to me. Outside, the rain began to patter against the window, echoing my melancholy mood. Rising, I picked up a photo from the table. A young boy and a woman, mother and son, their faces radiating happiness. Suddenly the phone rang, jolting me. It was John, my friend, and the only close person I had left since my father's recent passing. We worked together at the local factory. Hello, hey John, I greeted. David, he shouted, his voice bubbling with cheer. How's my buddy? Miss me? We haven't seen each other for a day. Guess what? Sarah from Demi's Diner wants to hang out tonight. She's bringing a friend. Interested? Wait, I interjected, trying to halt his verbal barrage. Maybe some other time. I shared the details of the letter. John listened intently and said he'd come over soon. True to his word, he arrived ten minutes later, bearing beer. Handing me a can, he sat down eagerly, urging me to spill the details. So, you've got a maternal grandfather you barely know, and he suddenly invites you over? And he's incredibly rich? John summarized. I nodded, and his excitement was palpable. Think about it, bro. Get on his good side, inherit his fortune, and say goodbye to our lousy factory jobs. His eyes sparkled with the prospect. While it was easy for John to say, he didn't know my grandfather. Yet the curiosity was gnawing at me. I decided to go. We spent a couple more hours discussing over beers, agreeing to leave the day after tomorrow. As John left, I headed to bed, the day's peculiar turn of events swirling in my mind, a mix of apprehension and intrigue lacing my thoughts. The night was restless, filled with strange dreams and a lingering sense of unease. The morning was still shrouded in darkness when John arrived. We had agreed to take his vehicle, a battered old Ford pickup that had seen better days. The day before, we'd managed to get a couple of days off from our boss, who, after a knowing look, had reluctantly agreed. We were good workers, never caused any trouble, so he was willing to accommodate our request. Our luggage was minimal. We packed a suitcase with some carefully chosen suits, grabbed a few snacks for the road, and a couple of cans of cola. Our destination was the neighboring state, a journey long enough to require stops along the way for necessities. It was early morning, the neighborhood still asleep, as I yawned and tossed the suitcase into the back seat. After a quick check to ensure I hadn't left anything on, I locked up the house and slid into the passenger seat. The truck roared to life, its sound amplified by a special muffler John had installed to mimic the rumble of a big rig. I glanced around guiltily, certain we had awakened the entire block. John hit the gas, and we were off. As we merged onto the highway, I rolled down the window, letting in a cool, gentle breeze. We rode in silence, both of us too groggy for conversation. My thoughts drifted towards the upcoming encounter with my grandfather. Memories of my mother surfaced. She had disappeared when I was just ten, 
The whole town had searched for her, but she was never found. Some said she got lost in the woods. Others speculated about a wild animal attack, but there were no traces, no clues. After her disappearance, I lived with my father. Her loss had hit him hard. He turned to drinking initially, but eventually pulled himself together and raised me. Life wasn't perfect, but it wasn't bad either. I often missed my mother, especially when my father sent me to stay with my grandfather during the summers. Those days weren't pleasant. My grandfather barely spoke to me, leaving me to my own devices in his city house. He owned another house, somewhere outside the city, but I had never been there. Lost in these reflections, a couple of hours slipped by. We crossed the state line and were soon approaching the city where my grandfather lived. Finally, we reached our destination, a small, close-knit town where gossip traveled faster than the wind. The town had a quintessential American provincial charm, with its main street lined with a blend of old brick buildings and a few modern establishments. A sense of community pervaded the air, but beneath the surface there was an unspoken tension, as if the town was holding its breath, waiting for something. We decided to grab lunch at a local diner, a typical American eatery that reminded me of the one from Pulp Fiction. A couple of motorcyclists and a few cars were parked out front. We stepped out of the truck and entered the cafe. The bell above the door jingled, announcing our arrival. We chose a booth near the window and soon, a middle-aged waitress approached us. She wore a charming apron and a friendly smile. Her name tag read, Becky. She handed us the menus with a warm smile. I ordered toast and coffee while John opted for an omelet. As Becky was about to leave, John inquired, could you tell us how to get to Mr. Fletcher's country house? Becky's eyes lit up. Oh, are you invited to his event? Let me show you. She pulled out her smartphone and pointed out the location on a map. It's just a half hour drive from here. I envy you. Mr. Fletcher is quite a figure in our town. The city's elite will surely be there. How are you related to him? John blurted out. He's his grandson, pointing at me. Really? Your grandfather is a great man. He renovated our local shelter with his own money and makes generous donations to the city treasury. In winter, he dresses up as Santa and visits poor families. He does a lot of good. Be proud, young man. I scratched my nose, feeling a mix of embarrassment and uncertainty, and nodded. At that moment, two police officers walked in. The first was about 45, with graying hair, of medium height and a pleasant face. The second was younger, around 30, with chestnut curls and a freckled face. Becky greeted them warmly. Hello, Becky, the usual for us, said the older officer. What's with the long faces something happened? Becky asked. Yeah, people are disappearing in the neighboring towns. The sheriff's called, asked for help in the search. Thankfully, it's calm here. My ears perked up. That's terrible. How many have gone missing? I heard it started just a week ago, Becky said. People have been disappearing for a while, but this time, 10 elderly people vanished all at once, the sheriff replied, setting his hat on the table. Something bad is happening, I can feel it. Becky shook her head in fear and went to place our order. John and I exchanged a glance and he whispered, I don't get it. You told me your grandpa was a nasty old man. How come everyone speaks so highly of him? I didn't answer. It was one of the reasons I disliked my grandfather. Only his assistant and I knew his true nature. He was always cordial with others, but as soon as they left, his mask would drop, revealing a sullen, malevolent face. It was a terrifying sight, and he never hid this side of himself from me. We finished our meal and headed towards the destination. The drive was uneventful, the town passing by in a blur of typicality. Soon, we arrived at the place. As we approached the house, several cars were already parked in front. We found a spot and stepped out, taking in the sight before us. John whistled in awe. It was a massive three-story mansion, surrounded by a perfectly manicured lawn and an array of small shrubs. We stood for a moment, admiring the grandeur, then walked towards the front door. Before we could knock, the door swung open. A woman in her forties stood in the doorway, dressed in a black, gray, and white dress. Her features were harsh, almost malevolent, and her hair, not too long, was teed neatly in a bun. It was Miss Olson, my grandfather's manager and assistant. 
I didn't know how long she had been with him, but she was already there when I visited as a child. Her stern face, even back then, was one reason I preferred her over my grandfather. She never hid her disdain for others. You've grown, David, but not for the better, she said bluntly, then turned to John. And who's this punk? He wasn't invited. He's John, my friend, a plus one, I said with a smile, looking at my stunned friend. Miss Olson scrutinized us silently for a moment, then turned and led us inside. The entry hall was richly decorated, with paintings adorning the walls and expensive vases in the corners. John looked around excitedly, elbowing me and whispering how I had hit the jackpot. We were shown to two adjacent rooms. Entering mine, I found a bedroom with a bed and bedside tables. Across from the bed was a large dresser. Settle in, Miss Olson instructed. The reception starts at 6 p.m. I'll come to get you. For now, stay here. Wait, what about meeting my grandfather? He's busy right now. You'll speak with him in the evening. John and I nodded in agreement. He went to his room, and I opened my suitcase, taking out an old suit inherited from my father. In the dresser, I found ironing equipment. I ironed the clothes, hung them up, and lay down on the bed, wondering what the evening would bring. Before I knew it, I drifted off to sleep. In my dream, I was ten years old, playfully begging my mother, Mom, let's go for a walk, please, let's go to the forest. No, son, it's late. We might get lost. I persisted, tugging at her long white dress, until she finally agreed. We stood at the forest's edge, and as I excitedly stepped forward, a loud knock on the door jolted me awake. Young master, it's time. The dinner will start soon. I opened my eyes to a gray ceiling and a fancy chandelier. My heart pounded. Why did I dream of that? Was it a dream or a memory? Trying to remember gave me a terrible headache. I washed my face in the bathroom, then dressed in the suit and walked to the hall, where John, oddly elegant in his suit and bow tie, was waiting. His unfamiliar appearance made me try to smile, but my heart kept pounding wildly. We descended to the main hall, where a crowd had already gathered. Not recognizing anyone, we simply nodded in greeting to those passing by. Miss Olson had already left on her errands, leaving John and me to head towards the buffet. After nibbling on some hors d'oeuvres, I washed it all down with champagne. We stood there for a while, taking in the scene. Suddenly the room's atmosphere shifted as my grandfather entered. I hadn't seen him in years and the change in him was striking. His once robust and healthy face had given way to a tired, sickly appearance. But his smile remained as warm and inviting as ever. The crowd greeted him with applause and cheers, to which he responded with a humble wave, almost as if embarrassed by the attention, and made his way to the center of the room. A distinguished man in a suit, the mayor, greeted him. He began, Dear friends, we're here to celebrate a man who is not only a respected citizen and a patron of our town, but also the most generous and kind-hearted individual among us. After a round of applause, he continued, Let us wish him a long life. As the mayor of this town, I want to present this medal for his outstanding contributions. He opened a beautiful red box, revealing a prestigious medal, which he then pinned on my grandfather's chest. Raising his glass, he toasted, and everyone followed suit. After sipping his champagne, my grandfather scanned the crowd, his gaze landing on me. For a fleeting moment, his smile faltered, but then he quickly recovered, beckoning me over with a wave. Reluctantly, I approached, feeling the weight of everyone's eyes on me. In truth, I've gathered you all to share some news. I am old and my time is short. Therefore, I'm leaving all my inheritance to my only kin, my grandson. His words left me stunned. A hesitant round of applause broke out, led by John who gave me a thumbs up. Gradually, everyone joined in. I looked at my grandfather, bewildered. He leaned in whispering, We'll talk later. Then, raising his glass once more, he moved away to converse with the mayor. I returned to John, still trying to process everything. The evening proceeded with various guests, approaching me with congratulations and well wishes for my grandfather. I nodded in gratitude, my eyes constantly drifting towards my grandfather, wondering what he was planning. As the night wore on, the guests began to disperse. Finally, the event concluded. My grandfather disappeared somewhere with the mayor, and Miss Olson reappeared to escort us back to our rooms. I never got the chance to speak with him. After washing up and changing, I lay in bed, 
my mind a whirlwind of thoughts. Before long, sleep overtook me, drawing me into a restless slumber. I awoke abruptly, engulfed in darkness. Have you ever experienced waking up in the dead of night, your breath heavy, your body paralyzed with fear? That's what happened to me. I lay motionless, my heart pounding, unable to turn my head to discern the source of my dread. The silence was deafening. Then, the bed creaked. Something was pressing down on my legs, slowly making its way up and settling amidst them. My heart raced with terror. I tried to sit up, to see if it was just John playing a trick. But it was too dark to see clearly. There was a shape on my legs, under the blanket. Too big to be a dog, but what then? I lay back down, too scared to move, fearing any motion might provoke whatever was sharing my bed. Time passed slowly, every second stretching into eternity. Then, the creature rose. My eyes, now accustomed to the darkness, made out a gaunt, hunched silhouette. It reminded me of the aliens from that Mel Gibson movie about crop circles, thin and eerie. It moved towards the door and left. My heart still pounded, my body felt numb and unresponsive. Eventually, I managed to calm my breathing and got up quietly, deciding to check on John. The corridor was pitch black, the lights unresponsive. I grabbed my phone and used it as a flashlight. Finding the light switch did no good. The electricity seemed to be out in the entire house. I proceeded to John's room, flashlight in hand. My heart sank when I found his room empty. A dreadful feeling overtook me. Recalling the creature from my room, I feared we were in grave danger. I decided to search the house for John. Walking down the corridor, I stumbled upon a small door leading to a trash chute. I peeked inside to see a deep square shaft and quickly moved on. I opened every door along the way, finding only bedrooms and storage rooms, all empty. My search continued until I reached a door at the end of the corridor. It led to a small laundry room, shelves lined with linens and blankets along the walls. The washing machine in the center was covered in blood, with a stream of blood flowing from its door onto the floor. My hand trembled. I hesitated, sensing something atop the machine. Overcoming my terror, I slowly raised the flashlight. There it was, a grotesque figure covered in fur with long hair, a hyena-like snout, and elongated claws as long as a man's finger. Its mouth was filled with rows of sharp, small teeth. It had a long, thin tail with a tuft at the end, swaying side to side. Its eyes glowed, staring directly at me. Paralyzed with fear, I felt a blow to the back of my head, and my legs gave way beneath me. The creature was the most repulsive and terrifying thing I'd ever seen. Suddenly, it snarled and coiled, ready to pounce. Reacting instinctively, I slammed the door shut just as it leaped. It crashed into the door with a thud, thrashing violently against it. I took a second to gather myself and then ran as fast as I could. My feet pounded against the cold floor as I ran, the roar and crash of the creature breaking through the door echoing behind me. I remembered the trash chute door and sprinted towards it. Desperation lent speed to my legs. Finding the door, I frantically squeezed through and tumbled into the abyss. I braced for impact, but the chute's angle changed and I was ejected into a room. I looked around, my phone had skidded away. Crawling, I retrieved it and shone its light around. It was a basement, windowless and bare, except for the walls scarred with deep scratches. The lair of that beast. I hurried to leave, fearing it might follow me down. Finding a door, I pulled it open. It was unlocked. Stepping into the corridor, I found myself in a catacomb-like passage with a low ceiling and narrow paths, dimly lit by red lights. Left or right? A fresh breeze from the left decided for me. The corridor widened as I progressed, leading to a large, oval room. In the center stood a stone slab, stained with blood, resembling a bed. Beside it lay a chain with one end attached to the slab and the other ending in a collar. My flashlight beam revealed more horrors, a severed human finger on the floor. Panic engulfed me, my heart racing uncontrollably. Then, a distant thumping sound, thud, thud, thud. I looked around, frightened, and decided to flee. At the room's other end, I found a passage and hurried through. Soon I stumbled upon a door leading to a surveillance room filled with screens and a control panel. 
the main screen showed the stone slab room, while the others displayed various rooms holding people, mostly elderly, lying apathetically in their beds. A chill ran down my spine as I spotted John in one of the rooms. What in God's name was happening? I had to rescue him and escape. I checked my phone. No signal. Deep underground, I thought. My eyes caught a set of keys hanging near the door and a pistol in a low drawer. Bingo. I grabbed both, checked the gun's safety, and tucked it behind my waistband. Leaving the room, I continued down the corridor, now lined with prison cells, each with a small barred window. The prisoners begged for rescue as they saw me. I apologized, promising to return with help. Finally, I found John, semi-conscious on a bed. As I opened the door and began to help him up, a loud thump echoed in the distance. We were too late. The creature appeared around the corner, and I hastily pulled John back into the cell, closing the door. The monster, playing with its prey, carried a human arm in its mouth, swinging in time with its strides. Saliva mixed with blood dripped from its jaws. In its hand, it held a human leg, attached to a chain and shackle, a macabre toy. It flung the leg against the walls, creating the ominous thumping. It entered the room, eyes scanning its surroundings. The prisoners fell silent and I slid down, hiding in the shadows. Panting and heart racing, I locked the door and collapsed in a corner, daring not to move. The creature's roars and the thunderous crashes outside sent shivers down my spine. As I huddled there, memories of the recent disappearances in neighboring towns invaded my thoughts. Could it be that my grandfather was behind this? Was he feeding people to this monster? The notion sent a chill through me. Suddenly, silence descended. Had the creature left? Cautiously, I crept to the small window in the door and peered out. Just inches from my face, the creature's visage appeared, its foul breath reeking of blood. Its cold eyes regarded me as if I were prey. I recoiled in horror, grateful for the locked door that held against its violent attempts to break in. Eventually, it gave up and lumbered away. My heart still pounding wildly, I gathered the courage to look again. The creature had returned to the room with the stone slab. Perhaps this was our chance to escape. I carefully helped John to his feet. He was slowly regaining consciousness. What's happening? He muttered groggily. We're in deep trouble, I replied. We made our way cautiously down the opposite corridor, which narrowed into a tight passage, ending at a staircase. Hope surged as we ascended. At the top, a door stood before us. I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking. Despair mounted as key after key failed to turn in the lock. Finally, with trembling hands, I tried the last key. It turned with a click and the door swung open. We rushed through, finding ourselves in another corridor lined with open doors. Peeking into each room, we discovered a kitchen and a lounge area. Pressing on just as we neared the exit, a voice stopped us cold. Wait, young master, it's too early for you to leave, Mrs. Olson said, her voice chillingly calm. In her hands, she held a large shotgun, aimed directly at us. Your grandfather awaits and wishes to speak with you. Please follow me. We had no choice but to comply. We stepped out into the kitchen, a stark contrast to the horrors we had just witnessed, an ordinary kitchen. Then we were led to the grand hall and up to the second floor where a large door loomed. Mrs. Olson knocked, and we entered. The room was a grand study, lined with bookshelves and dominated by a large desk, behind which my grandfather sat, engrossed in a book, a cigar smoldering between his fingers. We approached the desk. He finally set aside his book and extinguished his cigar, his gaze lifting to meet ours with a look of displeasure. So, grandson, you've seen the burden that comes with my legacy, that creature, in a way, is now part of your inheritance, he said, his voice cold. You're insane, I shouted, my anger boiling over. Did you lock up John to feed him to that thing? You kidnapped people to feed that monster, he replied, his voice steady. I had no choice. As you saw, they were only the elderly. I never fed it the young. Confused and horrified, I demanded. Why? Why keep such a thing in the basement? Suddenly, he grew furious his face contorting in rage. It's all your fault, he yelled. I fell silent, struggling to comprehend his accusation. But before he could explain further, a loud noise erupted from outside the door. 
Mrs. Olson interjected, Sir, the creature is loose. We must act. With a grunt, my grandfather stood and walked to a cabinet, retrieving a rifle and tranquilizer darts. He loaded the gun and stepped out, leaving Mrs. Olson with us. The cacophony outside eventually ceased, but my grandfather didn't return. Fear was etched on John's face. What to do next? Mrs. Olson had gone to check the situation, and when she didn't return, unease gripped me. I decided to investigate. Cautiously, I opened the door and peered outside. The corridor was deserted. Then, a blood-curdling scream shattered the silence. Mrs. Olson's voice, filled with desperation and terror. Second thought, I rushed towards the screams, pistol drawn. John followed close behind. I sprinted into the living room, where I was met with the most horrific sight. The creature held Mrs. Olson's head in one hand and her body in the other. My legs turned to jelly. I aimed at the creature and fired. The bullet hit its arm and it dropped the body. It hurled the head at me and leaped upwards. I fired again and again. The creature ran along the walls, but another shot to its legs sent it crashing to the ground. As I prepared to finish it off, a cry from my grandfather stopped me. Stop! Don't kill her! She's your mother! His words stunned me. My mother? A piercing headache hit, and memories flooded back. The day in the woods with my mother. We were happy until a creature attacked her. Her last words were for me to run. I found my grandfather and told him what happened. He returned with her bloodied body, blaming me for her death. Snapped back to reality by the creature lunging at me, I hesitated to shoot. John tackled us both and we tumbled to the floor. The pistol clattered away. John grabbed it and emptied the magazine into the creature. It twitched and then lay still. John checked me for injuries, finding none serious. We turned to my grandfather, who was bleeding and weak. He grabbed my hand and pulled me close. I loved my daughter, but she died because of your whim. Why couldn't you just stay home? He gasped. John slapped him. You sick bastard. How could you blame a child? Why keep that creature here? It wasn't her anymore. My grandfather tried to respond, but his strength faded. His eyes remained open, fixed in a final gaze. I closed them gently, then called 911. Soon the police arrived. I led them to the body. Where the creature had been, now lay the body of a young woman, my mother. Her face bore an expression of relief, as if released from a lifetime of suffering. I couldn't bear the sight, turning away to vomit. John helped me up, and we explained everything to the police, leading them to the dungeon. The captives were rescued, and soon the house was swarming with police. After giving our statements, John and I were taken to the station. We were released after a day and finally headed home, leaving behind the nightmares of that house. Story 2 This diary was discovered by hikers on August 10, 2019 in the forest. It is still unknown what happened to its owner. June 15 Dear Diary Today I embarked on a journey, one that lured me into its embrace with a promise of solitude and serenity. As I write this, the dim light of my lantern casts elongated shadows on the walls of my small tent, and I can't help but feel a mix of excitement and an unexplainable sense of foreboding. I've always sought refuge in the depths of the forest. It's been a sanctuary, a place where the cacophony of the world fades into a symphony of rustling leaves and distant bird calls. This time, my destination was a trail hidden in the heart of the National Park, whispered about by locals but seemingly untouched by the throngs of tourists that visit the other parts of the park. My day started with the familiar ritual of preparation. I meticulously packed my backpack, ensuring I had all the essentials, water, food, a first aid kit, and of course my trusty diary. Breakfast was a simple affair, just a bowl of oatmeal and a steaming cup of black coffee, the kind that clears your head and sharpens your senses. Leaving my small cozy apartment, I drove towards the park, the city's noise fading into a serene silence as I ventured deeper into the wilderness. The trailhead was not marked. It was as if nature herself had conspired to keep it a secret, a path meant only for those who truly respected her. As I stepped onto the trail, I was immediately enveloped by the scent of pine needles and damp earth, a fragrance that always seemed to calm my restless soul. My hiking boots crunched on the carpet of fallen leaves, each step a steady beat in the quiet of the forest. The trees stood tall and majestic, their branches swaying gently in the breeze. Sunlight filtered through the canopy, 
creating a kaleidoscope of light and shadow that danced on the forest floor. I took my time, absorbing every detail, every nuance of the woods around me. I found a clearing and decided to set up camp as the light began to fade. The process was familiar and comforting, but I couldn't ignore the prickling sensation on the back of my neck, the sense that something unseen lingered just beyond the veil of trees. June 16th. Dear Diary, As dawn broke, I awoke to the eerie silence of the forest, a stark contrast to the gentle chirping of birds I'm accustomed to. The air was cool and moist, sending a shiver down my spine as I crawled out of my sleeping bag. Breakfast was a simple affair, a granola bar and a few sips of water from my flask. I packed my tent with meticulous care, ensuring every item was in its place. There's a comfort in routine, even more so in a place as unpredictable as this. The further I ventured, the more the forest seemed to transform. The trees grew taller, their thick canopies intertwining to form a natural vault that blocked out most of the sunlight. It was like stepping into another world, one where the rules of nature were rewritten by shadow and silence. My backpack, filled with supplies for the journey ahead, weighed heavily on my shoulders. Inside were my essentials, a small cooking stove, extra clothing, a flashlight, and, of course, my diary. I felt a strange comfort knowing I had everything I needed to survive. Yet a nagging sensation told me there were things in these woods that no amount of preparation could account for. As I trudged along the barely visible path, the silence of the forest was almost tangible. It was as if the dense canopy above swallowed every sound, leaving a void that was filled only by the occasional creak of a branch or the distant rustle of an unseen creature. It felt like walking through a dream, ethereal and disorienting. Lunch was a brief affair, a sandwich I had packed earlier now slightly squashed but still edible. I sat on a Phelan log, listening to the silence, trying to discern any sign of life. But there was nothing, just the whisper of the wind through the trees. The shadows in the forest seemed to have a life of their own. They danced at the edges of my vision, forming shapes that vanished when I turned to look directly at them. It was a trick of the light, I told myself, but a part of me couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more, something lurking just out of sight. As the day wore on, I found myself growing more uneasy. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves seemed amplified, as if the forest was whispering secrets meant only for me. My thoughts turned to tales of old, stories of spirits and creatures that roamed woods such as these, unseen by human eyes. As evening approached, I set up camp in a small clearing. The process was now familiar, pitching the tent, gathering wood for a small fire, preparing a simple meal of canned soup and bread. Yet, the routine did nothing to ease the growing sense of dread. Night in the forest was a different world altogether. The darkness was complete, a blackness so deep it felt like a physical presence. I lay in my tent, listening to the sounds of the night, each one sending a jolt of fear through me. It was irrational, I knew, but the fear was real, as real as the beating of my heart. June 17th. The day began with the usual routines that now framed my existence in these woods. I boiled water on my small camping stove for a cup of instant coffee, its bitter taste a comforting reminder of normalcy. Breakfast was a packet of instant oatmeal, eaten quickly as I packed up my camp. The simple acts of rolling up my sleeping bag and folding the tent had become meditative, a moment of calm before the unknowns of the day. As I walked, the forest seemed to close in around me. The trees, tall and foreboding, cast long, dark shadows that stretched across the path. The air was still, the usual rustling of leaves eerily absent. My footsteps seemed unnaturally loud, each crunch of leaf and snap of twig echoing in the silence. It was in the late afternoon when I stumbled upon it, a small clearing that seemed out of place amidst the dense foliage. What caught my eye first was a circle of stones laid out in the center of the clearing. They were arranged meticulously, each stone carefully positioned, creating a pattern that felt deliberate, ritualistic. I stepped closer, curiosity overcoming my initial hesitation. The stones were of varying sizes and shapes, but all bore signs of having been handled, their surfaces smooth and worn. The circle was precise, almost unnervingly so, as if it had been laid out with a purpose I couldn't fathom. Scattered around the clearing, I found clumps of animal hair. The hairs were coarse and of different colors, 
Some were matted and tangled, others lay in neat piles, as if placed there with intention. The sight sent a shiver down my spine. It was as if I had stumbled upon a scene from a tale meant to be told in hushed tones around a campfire. The rational part of my mind tried to dismiss it as the work of animals or perhaps a prank by other hikers. But the atmosphere of the clearing was heavy, charged with an energy that felt almost palpable. I recalled stories I'd heard, tales of strange occurrences in remote woods, of rituals and unexplained phenomena. As I left the clearing, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The rest of the day passed in a blur of unease. June 18th. Last night as I lay in my tent, enveloped in the suffocating darkness of the woods, an unsettling experience shattered the fragile veil of my courage. The night air was cool and still, a stark contrast to the turmoil within me. As I tried to sleep, a faint sound caught my attention. Whispers, faint and indistinct as if carried on the breeze from just beyond the edge of the clearing. My heart pounded in my chest, and I lay frozen, straining to catch any coherent words. But it was all in vain. The whispers were a muffled cacophony, a language of shadows and fear. I spent the night in a state of heightened alertness, every sense attuned to the slightest sound. Sleep eluded me, and when dawn finally broke, it was a relief, albeit a weary one. June 19th. This morning, as I prepared to continue my journey, I discovered that my compass, which had been a reliable guide until now, had gone haywire. The needle spun wildly, without any sense of direction rendering it useless. I felt a surge of panic, a realization of just how reliant I had become on this small instrument for a sense of stability. Attempting to retrace my steps proved futile. The landscape itself seemed to have altered, as if the forest had reshaped itself overnight. Familiar landmarks were gone replaced by an unrecognizable terrain that twisted and turned in a disorienting dance. As the day wore on, my situation grew increasingly diary. I tried to maintain a straight path, marking trees as I passed, but every time I looked back, the mark seemed to have vanished, swallowed by the forest. My provisions, though carefully rationed, were dwindling. Lunch was a meager affair, a handful of nuts and a few dried fruits. I ate mechanically, my mind consumed by the predicament I found myself in. The silence of the woods was oppressive, broken only by the occasional distant rustle that sent shivers down my spine. The feeling of being watched, which had been a mere whisper at the back of my mind, was now a constant presence, an unseen observer in the sea of trees. As evening approaches, I set up camp with hands that tremble slightly, not just from physical exhaustion, but from the growing fear within. The isolation of the forest is weighing heavily on me a tangible force that threatens to crush my resolve. I'm determined to stay strong, to find my way back to the trailhead and out of this nightmare. But as I sit by my small fire, staring into the flickering flames, I can't help but feel a sense of despair. The forest, with its shifting shadows and unexplained phenomena, seems to be a puzzle with no solution, a maze with no exit. June 20th. The trees surrounding my campsite were no longer just silent sentinels of the forest. They had become canvases for cryptic symbols. These markings, etched deeply into the bark, bore the look of an ancient script, reminiscent of a forgotten civilization. Each symbol was intricate, composed of lines and curves that seemed to hold a meaning far beyond my understanding. The air around me felt unnaturally cold, an icy chill that made my breath visible in puffs. Despite it being the height of summer, I stood there, amidst the etched trees, a sense of unease growing within me. June 21st. I've been walking for hours, yet the forest refuses to yield any path to escape. The trees, towering and unyielding, seem to close in around me, their branches intertwining like the bars of a cage. Every step I take feels futile, a march in place in a world that defies all sense of direction and logic. The whispering that once was a faint, distant sound has grown louder, a constant murmur that surrounds me. It's as if the forest itself is speaking in a tongue I cannot comprehend, a symphony of rustling leaves and creaking branches that forms a language of its own. Every sound in the forest sends my heart racing. The crack of a twig underfoot, the rustle of leaves in the wind, each noise is a jolt of fear, a reminder of my vulnerability in this vast, unknowable wilderness. The sensation of being watched has grown stronger, 
an oppressive feeling that I can't escape. I've become hyper aware of my surroundings, my senses stretched to their limits. I catch glimpses of movement in the corner of my eye, but when I turn, there's nothing there, just the endless expanse of trees and shadows. As I sit here, writing this, the loneliness of my situation weighs heavily on me. Despite the fear, despite the growing sense of hopelessness, I refuse to give up. I will continue to look for a way out. Tomorrow, I will set out again. June 22nd. Today, in a turn of events that defies logic, I found myself standing once again before the stone circle. The sight of it sent a chill down my spine. It was as if the woods were toying with me, leading me in circles, mocking my attempts to escape. As I stood there, surrounded by the ancient stones, the air around me felt charged, heavy with an unspoken menace. The symbols etched into the bark of the surrounding trees seemed to leer at me, a silent reminder of the forest's mysteries and my own growing despair. In my desperation, I tried to leave a trail of markers, small cairns of stones and tied pieces of cloth on branches, hoping to create a path I could follow back. But as I moved forward and looked back, the markers disappeared, as if the forest itself was erasing my efforts, swallowing every attempt to understand or escape its grasp. June 23rd. Today I saw something that has shaken me to my core. As I walked, a fleeting glimpse of a figure caught my attention. It was there among the trees, a presence that was both terrifying and mesmerizing. It moved like a shadow, fluid and elusive, vanishing before I could truly focus on it. The figure was dark, an amalgam of beast and human, a form that defied explanation. The sight of it sent a wave of terror through me, a primal fear that clutched at my heart. As I write this, my hands are shaking, the pen barely steady in my grasp. The encounter has left me feeling more alone, more vulnerable than ever before. The forest, with its whispering trees and shifting shadows, has become a prison, and I am its lone, forsaken inmate. The realization of my helplessness is crushing. I am lost in a place where the rules of the world I know do not apply, where every step takes me deeper into a nightmare that I cannot wake from. June 24th. The whispering has become constant, an unending stream of voices that fill my ears with a cacophony that drowns out all thoughts of hope or escape. The voices are unintelligible, a jumble of sounds that seem to mock my desperation. They rise with the wind, seep through the leaves and echo in the hollows of the trees. At times, the whispers swell into a chorus that seems almost celebratory, as if rejoicing in my torment. They are everywhere and nowhere, a presence that I cannot escape, a reminder of my complete isolation in this cursed place. The shadows among the trees have taken on a life of their own. They grow and shrink, twist and turn, forming shapes that defy the laws of nature. In the dim light of dusk and dawn, I see figures lurking in the periphery of my vision, spectral beings with wolf-like fur, their forms ghostly and indistinct. These apparitions move with a fluid grace, a silent ballet performed for an audience of one. They are both terrifying and mesmerizing, a manifestation of the forest's dark heart. I find myself staring at them, trying to discern some meaning, some purpose behind their presence. I feel my grip on reality slipping, the line between the real and the imagined blurring into obscurity. The forest, with its unending whispering and shifting shadows, has become a crucible, testing the limits of my mind. Sometimes, in moments of desperation, I yell at the apparitions, my voice raw with fear and frustration. Other times, I find myself pleading with them, begging for respite, for some semblance of peace. But my cries go unanswered, lost in the endless whisper of leaves and wind. The creatures, the shadows, the voices, they all seem to be playing a cruel game with me. They feed on my fear, drawing closer, their presence more oppressive with each passing day. It's as if the forest itself is alive, a malevolent entity that delights in my suffering. As night falls, I huddle in my tent, the flimsy fabric offering little protection against the horrors that lurk outside. The darkness is complete, a suffocating blanket that smothers all hope. The whispers grow louder, more insistent, a relentless tide that threatens to sweep me away into madness. I cling to the remnants of my sanity, a drowning man grasping at the last straws of reason. I must find a way out, escape this labyrinth of fear and illusion, but with each passing moment, the forest tightens its grip, drawing me deeper into its embrace. 
June 25th. Today, in a cruel twist of fate, I stumbled upon my own campsite. It was a surreal and disheartening moment to come face to face with the evidence of my own futile attempts to escape. The sight of the familiar tent, the extinguished fire pit and my own footprints leading away and back again was like a taunt from the forest, a mocking reminder of my entrapment. The realization that I have been walking in circles hit me with the force of a physical blow. The woods are not just a labyrinth of trees and shadows. They are a maze that warps time and space, a puzzle that defies all logic and understanding. My senses can no longer be trusted. Each shadow, each rustle of leaves feels like a trick, a deception crafted by the forest to lead me further astray. The whispers are now a constant din in my ears, a soundtrack to my unraveling sanity. My body is weak, drained of energy by the relentless stress and the meager rations I have left. My mind feels fractured, splintered by the relentless terror and confusion. The barrier between dreams and wakefulness has crumbled, leaving me in a state where nightmares and reality merge into a single, horrifying existence. Sleep when it comes offers no respite. It is a fitful, restless state where the horrors of the forest invade my dreams. I wake from one nightmare into another, a never-ending cycle of fear and despair. Even the act of writing in this diary, once a source of comfort, has become a struggle. My thoughts are disjointed, my handwriting shaky. I write not out of hope, but out of a desperate need to cling to some semblance of normalcy, to prove to myself that I still exist beyond the madness that envelops me. June 28th. Dear Diary, the shadows in the woods I have come to realize are not mere ghosts or figments of my imagination. They are sentient beings, intelligent and malevolent. They have been toying with me, erasing my footprints, leading me in endless circles, driving me to the brink of madness. These entities move with purpose, a sinister intelligence guiding their actions. They appear and disappear at will, their forms blending into the darkness of the forest, making them almost impossible to discern. The forest itself, I am convinced, is a living, breathing monster. It consumes those who dare to venture into its depths, feeding on their fear and confusion. I am but its latest victim, a pawn in a game that I never stood a chance of winning. The trees, the shadows, the whispers, they are all part of this malevolent entity. The forest is alive in a way that defies understanding, a predator cloaked in leaves and bark. As I write these words, my body is numb, overwhelmed by a cold that seeps into my bones. My thoughts are a jumbled mess of fear, resignation, and despair. I can feel them coming for me, the shadows, the unseen watchers. There is no escape, no hope of salvation. I am finished, defeated not just by the physical challenges of the forest, but by the psychological torment it has inflicted upon me. All I can do now is express my regrets, the things I left unsaid and undone. I think of Jenny, the love I never declared, the future will never have. The pain of that unspoken love is a sharp contrast to the numbness that envelops me. I am pathetic, a man who sought to conquer a force beyond his understanding and failed miserably. If by some chance this journal is found, let it be a warning to anyone who reads these words. Stay away from this forest. It holds secrets and horrors beyond human comprehension, a darkness that swallows the light of reason and sanity. This forest is not a place for the living. It is a domain of shadows and whispers, a realm where the line between the real and the unreal blurs into obscurity. Story 3 I've always loathed working during Christmas. It's not like anyone enjoys it, but for the past 15 years, I haven't spent a single Christmas with my family. I'm in the hotel business, and for us, Christmas is peak season, like a local diner during a lunch rush. I remember my first day standing at the reception desk, greeting clients. Fast forward 15 years, I'm now the deputy director and head of strategic planning. And finally, I could afford to delegate hotel care and spend Christmas with my family. Sitting in my office, behind my new desk, staring at my computer screen, a sense of unease lingered. A message notification distracted me. It was from my wife, sending pictures of our six-year-old son decorating our house for Christmas. He held a string of lights in one hand and a plush Santa in the other. Smiling, I scrolled through more photos until another message popped up. This time from my boss. One thing I hate is my boss contacting me out of the blue. 
there you are minding your own business and he calls, hey Mark, guess where I am? Look, I'm in the Himalayas. And before you know it, you're on a plane to Nepal. That's Mr. Robinson. His relentless drive for something new helped him build a network of hotels across the USA and worldwide. But working with him is exhausting. Be ready to jump at any time, day or night. With a sinking feeling, I opened his message. There he was, his cheerful face against a backdrop of some village with a towering mountain behind. The landscape was breathtaking. Then the phone rang. Hello, Mark, guess where I am? I had no idea, boss. I'm in Alaska, Mark. Alaska. I found this amazing village, and I need you to come assess its potential. It's half a day's journey from Anchorage in the Chugach mountain range. I'll send you the coordinates. You need to come here immediately. I sighed, scratching my head. Okay, boss. I'll be on the first flight out. Great, see you soon. And he hung up. Damn it. There goes Christmas with the family. I could already picture their disappointed faces, but work is work. First, I googled the village's name and the usual list came up. The first link was a Wikipedia description. I clicked on it and browsed the information. It was a small village, about 300 years old. Nothing striking, but the landscape photos were impressive. Then I checked other search results. The second link led me to a forum. A thread caught my eye. Dude, never go to this place. I started reading more. Phrases like, the creepiest place on earth. I love the supernatural, but damn, never go there. This place is cursed, popped up. These messages unsettled me. That was the first red flag. Assessing the investment potential of this place, I'd already say it doesn't bode well, but my boss was stubborn and never backed it down. I searched it a bit more, then visited an airline website and booked it a ticket. It was December 23rd, and the earliest flight from Denver, Colorado, where I lived, to Enshoriji was at 6 Wui Gar AM. As I stood in line for boarding at Denver International Airport, the lively bustle of the crowd enveloped me. The terminal's vast open architecture loomed overhead, its legendary peak-shaped roof mimicking the snowy Rocky Mountains. The hall was adorned with Christmas decorations, fir trees and garlands adding to the festive atmosphere. Amidst this, the faces of my wife and child haunted me, as they were about to spend yet another Christmas without me. I had gifted my son a brand new PlayStation, hoping it would earn his forgiveness. At his age, he forgives quickly, but I worried about the coming years, the difficult teenage times. Maybe he would resent me for all these missed holidays. I need to spend more time with my family. As the line inched forward, bringing me closer to the gate agents methodically checking boarding passes and IDs, I accidentally stepped on the heel of a young man in front of me. I quickly apologized. He turned around, a young guy with his hair casually tied in a bun, bright blue eyes, dressed in a blue jacket, jeans, and trekking boots. I liked him instantly. Sometimes you meet someone and just know you're on the same wavelength. That's how it felt with Elias. We struck up a conversation. He was around 25, worked in Denver in a fascinating field called cryptozoology, he explained as the line moved. His job involved studying and searching for rare and mythical animals. He worked at a small but prestigious scientific research lab, collaborating with universities and private ecological foundations. As we talked, I noticed something off about him. He was energetic and engaged, but occasionally overshadowed by a hint of depression and fatigue. It puzzled me, but I'm not one to pry into others' affairs, so I let it be. Finally, we boarded the plane and found out we were seated next to each other. I said, what a coincidence, we're seated together. Your seat is by the window, please go ahead. We settled in and braced for takeoff. The flight was going to be five to six hours so I pulled out my laptop to catch up on some work. Elias did the same. Glancing at his screen, I saw an image of a strange creature and asked, Looks interesting, is that what you're working on? He replied, Actually, we're focusing on a particular legend right now, the myth of Torningarsuk. Torningarsuk? I've never heard of it. Not surprising. Torningarsuk is a creature from Inuit mythology, described as a powerful spirit from another world. Legend has it he can take various forms, but he's often depicted as a bear, unusually large, with strong arms and magical abilities. In my village where I come from, he's depicted as a massive creature with two horns and a huge beard. 
Your village, which one is that? I asked. He named his village, and it turned out to be the very one I was heading to. When he learned this, he seemed a bit frightened and said, Mr. Harrison, I wouldn't advise going to that village. There are rumors and most of them are true. I told him about my boss being there and that I had to get there regardless. He sighed deeply, his face clouded over again. Well, if we're headed the same way, let's travel together. I agreed since we had already acquainted ourselves. It must be fate that we were to embark on this journey together. Elias became melancholic, and for the rest of the flight, we barely spoke, exchanging only a few words now and then. Finally, our plane landed at Anchorage Airport. As the airplane's wheels hit the tarmac, a sense of unease settled in my stomach. Landing in Anchorage, Alaska, wasn't just a change in location. It felt like stepping into an entirely different world. I glanced over at Elias, my traveling companion, who seemed equally pensive, his gaze fixed on the airplane window, where the sprawling, snow-covered landscape stretched out. The Anchorage airport was an odd mix of modern and rustic, with large wooden beams supporting the high ceilings and enormous windows offering views of the snow-draped scenery outside. As we made our way through the terminal, the sounds of our footsteps echoed faintly on the polished floors. Around us, a diverse crowd bustled, some clad in heavy winter gear, others still in the lighter clothes of the warmer climatus they had left behind. Overheat announcements blended with the low murmur of conversations and the occasional laughter, creating a constant, almost comforting background noise. Stepping outside, the cold Alaskan air hit us like a wall. The sky was a dull overcast gray, typical of northern winters, with a light snowfall that added a serene touch to the surroundings. In the distance, majestic mountains loomed, their peaks shrouded in clouds. Our next stop was the car rental, a small annex attached to the airport. The warmth inside was a welcome respite from the chilly outdoors. The rental agent, a middle-aged woman with a friendly demeanor, assisted us. When she heard our destination, a flicker of curiosity and caution crossed her face. She handed us the keys to a sturdy SUV, well-suited for Alaska's potentially challenging roads. Thanking her, we set off. The SUV felt robust and reliable as we navigated out of the airport area. The roads were well-maintained, but patches of ice required careful driving. The landscape around us was picturesque, snow-covered fields and dense forests, with occasional houses and small businesses dotting the view. As lunchtime approached, Elias and I began to feel hungry and kept an eye out for a place to eat. Eventually, we spotted a small roadside diner, its quirky log cabin standing out against the stark snow. A flickering neon sign read, Polar Bite Diner. We pulled into the nearly empty parking lot, the crunch of snow under the tires breaking the silence of the wild Alaskan nature. Upon entering, a bell above the door jingled, announcing our arrival. The diner was warm and cozy, with the aroma of coffee and cooked food in the air. A few locals sat at the counter, their weather-beaten faces briefly turning to appraise us newcomers before returning to their meals and quiet conversations. The other tables were occupied by a group of people who seemed out of place, exuding a somber atmosphere. Elias recognized them and went over to greet them. I decided not to intrude and approached the counter instead, looking over the menu. A local sitting nearby noticing Elias's interaction with the group muttered, another nutcase. Curiosity peaked, I asked. Sir, why do you say that? He gave me a measured look, seemingly sizing me up, then replied, They're from that village, the village of the mad. Every year around Christmas, they all gather there. They won't say why, but I've heard they see creatures that nobody else does. Many have gone there and seen nothing. They're all nuts. Confused, I scratched my head and glanced at the group, but saw nothing unusual about them. Soon after, Elias said his goodbyes, and we, having finished our meal, resumed our journey. The road ahead stretched long and serpentine, winding through the vast, untouched wilderness of Alaska. The further we drove, the more I felt detached from the world I knew. The landscape around us was a breathtaking expanse of nature in its raw form. Sprawling forests with tall pines, whose branches were laden with snow, and immense open fields that seemed to stretch endlessly towards the horizon. Elias drove in silence, his hands gripping the steering wheel tightly, eyes fixed on the road. I decided to break the silence. Hey, those people we met at the diner, were they your acquaintances? He finally tore his gaze away from his thoughts and replied, 
Yes, they are from my village. I hesitated before asking. You know, I didn't want to pry, but there are various rumors about your village. Blogs on the internet say things like, don't go to that village, it's really creepy. And at the diner, a local guy called you psychos and said, you see some kind of creatures? Though I didn't agree with him, I was curious. Can you explain what's going on? Elias was quiet for a moment, then exhaled and said, Maybe I'll sound like a real psycho to you, but what that guy said is partly true. Our village is indeed cursed. He glanced at me, waiting for my reaction. I had never believed in curses, mysterious creatures and other nonsense, but always respected others' opinions or their superstitions. I replied, Interesting. How does this curse manifest? I mean, how did you realize you were cursed? Does someone come and take you away? Or are you struck by lightning or something? He answered, Actually, your words are not far from the truth. Did you notice that group of people I greeted? Why do we all go back to our village specifically for Christmas? It's because we perform a ritual. If anyone from the village who has the blood of the founders don't returns for Christmas, they will meet death. What? I exclaimed, incredulous. That can't be true. He responded, of course, it's hard to believe in the 21st century, but the biggest advantage of our time is that we can count, and the numbers say that about 100 villagers who were outside the village on Christmas have died over the last 50 years. That's a fact. I stared at him, shocked. Was he serious? Seeing my disbelief, he said, Mr. Harrison, it may all seem like nonsense, but it's true. All the evidence is in our village. When we get there, I'll show you. I replied, I can't say I believe you, but I won't argue. Silence fell again, and I felt awkward about our conversation, so I changed the subject. I started talking about my work and different stories that had happened to me, which seemed to distract him from his troubling thoughts. He, in turn, told me about various creatures they had studied. As we progressed, the road became narrower and less maintained. Asphalt gave way to gravel, and in some places, simply to compacted snow and ice. The SUV handled well, but the occasional skidding was a reminder of the harshness of the landscape. The snowfall intensified, reducing visibility. Ilias slowed down. I peered out of the window trying to discern any landmarks, but the world outside had turned into a blur of white and gray. The occasional snow-covered road signs were the only indication that we were still on the right path. As we approached the outskirts of the village, the snow-laden trees began to thin, giving way to open spaces. The first thing that struck me as we approached the village was an eerie silence, enveloping everything around us. The village, nestled in a shallow valley, was surrounded by tall, snow-covered pines that stood like silent sentinels. Behind the village, a massive mountain, known to locals as Whispering Peak, loomed. Its peak, shrouded in perpetual mist, gave it a mythical aura. Its steep, forest-covered slopes thinned towards the snowy summit, creating an awe-inspiring view. The beauty of the place was undeniable, and I understood Elias's fascination with it. As we entered the village, the sparse spacing of the houses became apparent. Separated by wide expanses of untouched snow, these were old wooden structures, reminiscent of early Alaskan architecture. Their steep roofs, designed to prevent snow accumulation, added to their quaint appearance. Despite this, a sense of abandonment permeated the air as if the village hung on to existence by a mere thread. It seemed the locals didn't live here but returned only for Christmas. The roads were more like narrow, poorly maintained paths, created out of necessity rather than design. They were convenient in places, suggesting recent human activity, but there were no signs of life, no sounds, no movement. The village itself seemed to have held its breath. Driving down the main street, an old partially dilapidated church caught my eye. Its wooden cross was slightly askew, and one window was boarded up. Elias pointed to a small building serving as the village's general store, with a few cars parked outside, the only sign of potential activity. The store, with its rustic charm, showed evident wear, depicting the harshness of life in this remote place. Across from the store was an open square that looked like a community gathering place, now abandoned and covered in snow. A few old benches and a frozen fountain were the sole remnants of life in this desolate square. However, the totems and symbols, inspired by the culture of Alaska's indigenous people and scattered throughout the village, 
were what truly sent shivers down my spine. They were weathered and worn yet hauntingly beautiful. Upon reaching the village center, Elias stopped the car. We got out, the crunch of our boots on the snow piercing the oppressive silence. We stood before an old two-story building, its wooden facade battered by harsh Alaskan elements, but still robust. The small, clean windows were adorned with curtains that seemed to belong to another era, floral and faded. Ilias informed me that this was the Elder's house, and that we would part ways here. His home was on the outskirts, and he wanted to meet his parents. He told me to come by if needed, as the locals would know his whereabouts. He might later stop by the Elder's house to show the proof he had promised. After thanking him, we parted ways. He walked off, and I headed to the house. The front door, made of solid wood, was intricately carved with scenes of wild nature, depicting bears, wolves, and trees. Hesitating, I knocked. The door opened instantly, as if the elder had been expecting me. He was a tall, lean man, his age evident in his deeply lined face and the silver streaks in his long hair tied in a traditional braid. His eyes, clear and sharp, seemed to hold decades of wisdom. Welcome he said in a deep resonant voice. I was expecting you. We exchanged greetings, and I entered. The entrance led to a large living room adorned with carvings, framed photographs, and paintings of the village and its surroundings. The antique handcrafted wooden furniture lent the room a timeless feel. A large fireplace crackled on one wall, casting warm glows throughout the room. Above the fireplace were shelves filled with artifacts, old books, jars filled with herbs, and culturally significant items. The elder invited me to sit on a sturdy wooden bench near the fireplace. Please, make yourself comfortable, he said. You must have many questions. I inquired about Mr. Robinson. The elder replied that he and his son had gone to explore the local mountains and would be back soon. He then offered me tea, which I accepted. As the steam filled the room, it created an atmosphere of warmth and hospitality. The elder began, Robinson arrived a week ago, I advised him to leave for Christmas, but he refused. We had previous acquaintance, and he once did me a great favor, so I reluctantly agreed to let him stay. You might have heard rumors about our village. Some may be true, some not. For your safety, I'd prefer you leave. But now, you should stay. We have an unusual ritual tonight. It will be an interesting experience. Regarding Mr. Robinson's desire to build a hotel here, I am strongly opposed. I won't convince you now but perhaps after Christmas you'll understand. I was about to respond when the front door opened and Mr. Robinson returned. Standing on the threshold was a tall, imposing man with broad shoulders hinting at a past steeped in sports. His hair, once likely jet black, was now dusted with gray, especially at the temples, giving him a distinguished appearance. His brown eyes flickered constantly with thoughts creating an impression of someone who perpetually analyzed the world around him. Dressed in a heavy parka, thermals, and gloves, he exuded an air of rugged preparedness. Behind him stood a young man, probably in his early twenties, likely the elder son. Mr. Robinson noticed me, greeted me with a smile, then shrugged off his coat and sat down on the couch. The elder brewed some tea, and the four of us sat in a circle in the warm atmosphere of the room. Mr. Robinson, holding a cup of tea, turned to me. So what do you think of the local landscapes? I told you they're incredible. Imagine, once we open a hotel here, people will flock in droves. The only problem is one stubborn old man. At this, the elder coughed disapprovingly. Mr. Robinson glanced at him with a smile and continued. There are also many historical artifacts here that tourists will find fascinating. Later, I'll show you their main totem you'll be amazed. I responded, yes, it's a breathtaking place, Mr. Robinson, but there are many rumors surrounding it. Even the locals say it's dangerous and it's better not to stay here. As I spoke, the elder nodded in agreement. Mr. Robinson waved his hand dismissively. That's all nonsense, superstitions. I've been to many places around the world but have never encountered anything supernatural. Then I told him what Elias had said about people dying at Christmas those who didn't return to the village, and that there was even proof of these deaths. The elder stood up and brought us a folder. It contained newspaper clippings, obituaries, and death reports. All these people had died on Christmas night. 
Looking at these clippings, I felt a tinge of fear. Mr. Robinson, however, remained unfazed. I wanted to ask the elder for more details. He sighed, looked out the window and began, According to legend, our village is cursed. Our ancestors committed a terrible sin. Since then, every Christmas a terrifying creature, or rather a spirit, known in Alaska as Tornagorsuk, visits our village. It comes at night and checks each person for sins. If it finds sins, it takes the person away. If someone is not in the village and doesn't pay tribute to the spirit, it will find them anywhere in the world and take their soul. Only those of us with the blood of the village's inhabitants can see this spirit. To others, it's invisible, untouchable, which is why many consider us mad. Some even say it's mass hysteria. But I assure you it's true. That's why I urge you, for your own safety, to leave. Mr. Robinson listened intently but clearly didn't believe a word. Being a pragmatic man, always focused on his goals, he waved off the story. I sighed, feeling a mix of skepticism and apprehension. The elder, too, sighed and said he had preparations to make for the ritual. His son would prepare some food for us. The elder left, and his son went to the kitchen. Once alone, Mr. Robinson turned to me. So, Mark, do you feel it? This atmosphere? This place is a gold mine. I was tempted to argue, but chose not to. We chatted briefly about our affairs, enjoyed the delicious meal prepared by the elder's son, and as evening approached, the son told us we should go outside to watch the ritual. We dress it and step it out into the chilling Alaskan night. As Mr. Robinson led me through the village to the main totem, the once deserted streets now teemed with life. People appeared from seemingly nowhere, bustling about with purpose. Cars rolled into the village, adding to the growing number of inhabitants and visitors. The evening light cast long shadows between the wooden structures, creating a hauntingly beautiful tableau. The totem, standing majestically at the village center, was an impressive sight. Towering over 20 feet high, it was expertly carved from a single massive log, depicting various animals. The wood had aged gracefully, its surface weathered by the harsh Alaskan elements, yet the carvings remained remarkably sharp and detailed. At the base of the totem was a large bear, its features exaggerated yet strikingly realistic. The bear stood on its hind legs, mouth agape as if mid-roar, and its eyes seemed to peer into one's soul. Surrounding the bear were figures of an eagle with widespread wings, a meticulously detailed salmon, and further up, the figures became more abstract and mythical. There was a creature that seemed a fusion of a wolf and a man, its form fluid and dynamic. At the very top was a being with a long beard and horns, its face a blend of a monster I couldn't quite place, half bear, half gremlin. It was truly intimidating. Now I understood Mr. Robinson's enthusiasm about this totem. As we stood admiring the totem, a large group of villagers began to gather around us. Their expressions were solemn, their eyes reflecting a mix of fear and vigilance. Among the crowd, I spotted Elias. The elder approached the totem, nodding respectfully to Mr. Robinson, before turning his attention to the carving. He began to speak in a language I didn't understand. His voice was rhythmic and ethereal. The villagers closed their eyes, some swaying slightly. Mr. Robinson tugged at my arm, and we stepped back to observe. As the elder chanted, another villager stepped forward, holding a bowl of herbs. He circled the totem, sprinkling the herbs at its base. The scent filled the air, lending a surreal atmosphere to the scene. The ritual was mesmerizing, almost hypnotic in its execution. An energy seemed to emanate from the totem, as if summoning something ancient and powerful. The villagers were deeply engrossed, their faces reflecting a range of emotions from reverence to something akin to fear. As we watched from the sidelines, the ritual drew to a close. The villagers slowly opened their eyes, the tension of the moment gradually dissipating. The elder spoke a few more words, his voice softer, almost soothing. The group quietly dispersed, leaving Mr. Robinson and me alone by the totem. We stood for a while gazing at the totem, which now almost seemed to come alive. Then we made our way back to the elder's house. The elder was standing outside, surrounded by a small group of people to whom he was speaking. As we approached, they were dispersing. Only his son and Elias remained. Without a word, we entered the house. We took off our coats and gathered around the fireplace. 
Breaking the silence, I said, Elder, that was a truly captivating ritual. What happens next? I thought you would all gather in one place to welcome Christmas. As I understand the danger comes at midnight before Christmas? The elder replied, Each person acts according to their conscience. Those who feel guilty pray desperately. Those confident and unbothered might even sleep peacefully, though there are few such people, believe me. Mostly we spend this time at home with our families, ready to say goodbye if necessary. I glanced at Elias, who had decided to stay with us, and mentally thanked him for his company. The elder continued, At midnight, we beat drums, signaling the time has come. You won't hear or see anything, but we witness it every year, and believe me, it's truly terrifying. The fact that the curse activates on Christmas is probably a coincidence, as Christmas is a Christian holiday. Perhaps it's tied to the myths of Santa Claus, giving coal to naughty children. But I cannot say for sure. If you saw the creature that comes at night, you would understand. We listened in silence, and the atmosphere around us grew increasingly eerie, especially seeing the fear and nervousness on the faces of the elder, Elias, and his son. Elias seemed particularly anxious. We spent the evening by the fireplace, talking. With half an hour to midnight, tension thickened in the elder's living room. The hosts grew increasingly nervous as the time drew nearer. Suddenly, a distant rumbling broke the silence. Not just I, but the elder, his son, and Elias, too, looked around in alarm. Mr. Robinson, seemingly oblivious, continued to sit, whiskey glass in hand. The rumbling persisted, intermittent, reminiscent of that scene from Jurassic Park, the one where the T-Rex approaches the car, causing ripples in a glass of water. It was eerily similar and frightening. I glanced at my companions, wondering if this was some elaborate prank, half expecting a TV host to jump out declaring a hidden camera setup. But nothing of that sort happened, and the sound grew steadily closer. Checking my watch, it was ten minutes to midnight. My nerves escalated. Elias, now deathly pale, looked as if he might burst into tears at any moment. I nudged him gently, asking what was happening. His voice shaky, he confessed. I think it's coming for me tonight. I have a sin. The elder and his son gasped in shock. What have you done? Why didn't you tell us earlier? The elder asked frantically. Elias, hugging his knees and taking uneven breaths, began. A few weeks ago in Denver. His voice was laced with regret. I was in a hurry for a meeting. I was late and... I took a parking spot reserved for drivers with disabilities. It was just for a few minutes or so it seemed... He paused, staring at his hands. I know it sounds trivial, but I've never done anything like it. It was a small decision made in haste, without consideration for others who might need this space more than me. The simplicity of his confession struck me. Such an act might seem insignificant, a fleeting lapse in a fast-paced life. But in Elias's conscience, magnified by the village's unfolding events, it took on significant weight especially given their lifelong teachings about retribution for misdeeds. His words hung in the air. Then the elder, handing Elias a flask, scolded, You fool! For such a trivial matter you burden yourself with guilt. You know the creature senses it. If it feels your guilt, it will take you. Calm down and don't be nervous. I watched, dumbfounded, as Mr. Robinson looked on, clueless about the unfolding drama. Meanwhile, the rumbling sound stopped, only to be replaced by the solemn chimes of the clock striking midnight. The sound echoed through the old wooden house. Outside, the village lay engulfed in darkness, the moon hidden behind dense clouds. A profound silence enveloped the surroundings, as if the world held its breath. Suddenly, the silence was shattered by a deep, resonating sound, seemingly coming from the earth itself, a mix of growling and roaring, unnaturally deep and bone-chilling. We exchanged anxious glances, except for Mr. Robinson, who still looked bewildered. Rushing to the window, we peered into the dark, snow-covered village. What we saw next froze us in place. Emerging from the forest was a colossal creature, at least twenty feet tall, with a thick, tangled beard and massive, twisted horns protruding from its head. It was clad in tattered garb, eerily reminiscent of a Santa Claus costume, but far from merry or festive. The creature moved slowly but purposefully, each step causing the ground to tremble slightly. Its eyes, glowing like hot coals, scanned the village, 
its gaze piercing as if it could see through walls and into our very souls. It approached houses, sniffing them out. A primal, instinctual fear gripped me, rooting me to the spot. Elias, noticing my expression, asked in confusion, Do you see it too? I nodded in terror. Whispers and cries began to emanate from the houses around us. It was clear that we were the sole witnesses to this horrifying spectacle. Mr. Robinson, still looking around in bewilderment, joined us at the window. The four of us stood there, watching in horror and anticipation as the creature made its way toward our house. As the creature approached our house, we instinctively backed away from the window, except for Mr. Robinson, who stood alone, unaware of our sudden retreat. The beast's heavy footsteps resonated as it neared, and then, with a terrifying swiftness, it leaned in and peered through the window. Our eyes met in shared fear. Elias continued to pray in terror. Before we could react, the creature's massive hand smashed through the window with a deafening crash, scattering wooden splinters and shards of glass across the room. A cold, sharp wind swept through, throwing Mr. Robinson aside. Paralyzed with fear, I stumbled backward. But Elias wasn't so lucky. The beast's enormous hand ensnared him effortlessly, lifting him from the ground. The elder jumped up, horror-stricken as he saw Elias in the grip of the monster. Don't accept the guilt! Fight it, Elias! He shouted desperately. Elias seemed to have fainted. The creature began to retreat, dragging Elias towards the shattered window. The elder and I lunged forward, trying to grasp Elias, but the beast was too powerful, too swift, it was about to swallow him whole. Then gunshots rang out. Mr. Robinson, wielding a shotgun, fired blindly at the beast. He couldn't see it, but the levitating Elias somehow guided his aim. The monster seemed unfazed, but the shot stirred Elias back to consciousness. He heard our cries. Just as the creature was about to engulf him, Elias's face turned resolute. The monster's hand halted. To our disbelief, it carefully set Elias back on the ground, emitting a deep, haunting sound that echoed into the night. Slowly backing away from the house, it never took its eyes off Elias and continued its path through the village. Elias collapsed, gasping, his body trembling from the ordeal. The elder rushed to him, relief and awe on his face. You fought it, Elias, you did well, he said, then looked toward the direction the creature had taken. Suddenly, a loud thud and a desperate scream pierced the air. The elder, visibly shaken, ran towards the sound. I helped Elias up, and we staggered back inside. The room was in disarray, cold night air pouring through the broken window. But at that moment, none of it mattered. We had witnessed something extraordinary, something inexplicable. Mr. Robinson stood petrified outside, his worldview shattered. I approached, placed a hand on his shoulder, and led him inside. Eventually, the tumultuous noises ceased. About an hour later, the elder returned, somberly reporting that a woman had been taken. We huddled around the fireplace, trying to process the night's events. As dawn broke, casting a soft light through the broken window, we sat together in silence. I began to understand why the villagers don't adorn this place for Christmas. While the world celebrated, they battled a nightly nightmare. The next day, as we sat in the car saying goodbye to the Elder and Elias, the idea of building a resort had vanished. We left in a trance-like state, silently pondering our experiences. Suddenly I wondered if my ability to see the creature meant I was now bound to return here each Christmas. I thought of my family, who might never get the chance to spend Christmas with me. My thoughts were interrupted by Mr. Robinson. Hello, old John. You're still working at the National Archives. I've got a case for you. I looked at my boss with warmth and realized that I wasn't alone with my problem, and maybe there was hope for us. Story 4 The house stood there, a quiet testament to suburban dreams, its panoramic windows like wide open eyes, gazing out over the manicured lawn. There was a stillness to it, a sort of hushed expectancy, as if the house itself was waiting, just as I was, for a new chapter to begin. I remember the first time I saw it, with Abby beside me, her hand finding mine, a wordless promise that yes, this was it. This was where we'd start our life together. We moved in early December, the air crisp and tinged with the scent of impending snow. 
The previous owners had left in a hurry, or so the realtor had told us, leaving behind bits and pieces of a life we knew nothing about. Furniture, some gardening tools, and, as we were soon to discover, a collection of personal belongings hidden away in the depths of the garage. It was Abby who suggested we decorate for the holidays. It'll feel more like home, she said, her voice echoing slightly in the still unfurnished living room. I agreed, thinking of the boxes the realtor had mentioned, tucked away in the garage. The garage was cold, the kind of cold that seeps into your bones, and it smelled faintly of motor oil and damp cardboard. I flicked on the light, the fluorescent tubes flickering to life with a low hum. There in the corner were the boxes, stacked haphazardly, dust covered and forgotten. I started rummaging through them, lifting lids and peering inside, hoping to find some forgotten holiday decorations. Instead, I found remnants of a life that once was, old photo albums, a collection of vinyl records, a stack of books with yellowed pages, and then, buried beneath a pile of old newspapers, a box labeled in faded ink. Jonathan's audio recordings. My name? A coincidence, surely, but it sent a shiver down my spine. I hesitated, then lifted the box, feeling its weight, the heaviness of its contents. Inside were cassette tapes, dozens of them, each carefully labeled in a neat, tidy script. Dates, titles like Large Rifts in Antarctica or Strange Glow in the Sky. Abby called out from the house, her voice distant. Find anything. I didn't answer, my attention fixed on the tapes. I felt a pull, a curiosity that went beyond mere coincidence. Who was this other Jonathan, and what were these notes he had left behind? Among the clutter of the garage, I found an old tape recorder, a relic from the past, just like the cassettes. I inserted the first tape, labeled, Number One, when I began to see. My fingers were numb as I pressed play, the mechanical whir of the tape filling the silence. And then, a voice, my voice. Unmistakably so, but older, wearier. No one understood anything it said. Didn't believe that it was all happening for real and how our lives would change soon enough. I stood there, in the cold, dim light of the garage, the voice from the tape recorder the only sound in the world. It was me, but it wasn't. The words made no sense, yet they filled me with an inexplicable sense of dread. I turned off the tape recorder, the weight of the voice still pressing down on me. It was my voice, no doubt, albeit distorted by the years and the magnetic tape, but when had I made these recordings? I remembered the cassettes, a vague memory from childhood, but nothing more. The idea of having made these recordings and then forgotten them was unsettling. With the box of tapes in hand, I walked into the living room, where Abby was arranging some books on the shelf. Abby, I called to her, trying to keep my voice steady. I found something strange in the garage. She turned, a smile on her face, but it faded when she saw my expression. What is it? she asked, walking over to me. I handed her the tape recorder. Listen to this, I said, pressing play. The voice filled the room, my voice, continuing its eerie narrative. I was busy working, Abby was doing the house. She knew I always dreamed of having my own house, so she tried to improve it to make it more cozy for me. Abby laughed, turning off the recorder. Very funny, Jonathan, she said. I get your hint. I'll make the house cozy and beautiful. I shook my head, frustration and fear mingling in my chest. It's not a joke, Abby. I don't remember making these recordings, and it's freaking me out. She looked at me, her expression changing from amusement to concern. You're serious, she said, her voice softening. Okay, I'll listen to them. I pressed play again, and the voice continued. Time went by quickly, and as the new year dawned, the world began to change very quickly. Here and there, natural disasters began to happen. A series of earthquakes occurred in Japan, Turkey, China, and other countries. Millions of people were affected. But it was somewhere far away, in countries I knew little about and had no interest in. I watched the news and was only superficially horrified by what was happening in the world. In fact, all my thoughts were occupied with the daily routine, until an earthquake struck my hometown. I was near my workstation in the cafe when it started shaking, it said, a haunting echo of a memory I couldn't recall. 
The tremor was sudden, violent. Around me, the world seemed to fracture, the cafe's walls crumbling as the earth convulsed beneath us. A large fault had formed in the middle of the street, a gaping maw that split the familiar cityscape into a before and an after. My heart raced as the voice detailed the horror of that moment. The office collapsed before my eyes, a brutal reminder of nature's indifference. Screams filled the air, a cacophony of fear and pain as my co-workers were caught in the rubble. The loss was immediate and overwhelming. My boss, people I'd known for years, gone in an instant. The tape painted a vivid picture of destruction and despair. I emerged dazed, the world I knew unrecognizable. The street was a cause of debris and exposed pipis. The innards of the city laid bar. Many were injured, some fatally. It was a scene of apocalyptic ruin, the kind you think only exists in movies or in distant lands. The voice grew softer, more introspective. In the aftermath, cut off from communication, I didn't know Abby had been hurt as well. It was only later, in the sterile quiet of the hospital, that I found her. She was near the epicenter of the quake, had borne the brunt of its fury. Abby survived, but the cost was etched in the loss of part of her arm, a physical scar of an unseen wound. At this point, Abby had turned off the tape recorder, her eyes alight with hurt and accusation. This is a bad joke, Jonathan. Why would you make something like this? She had asked, her voice a mix of anger and disbelief. I had tried to explain, to tell her about finding the tapes in the garage, about the uncanny resemblance of the voice to mine. But it was too much. She had walked away, leaving me alone with the recorder and the tapes. Despite the fear and the surreal nature of it all, I couldn't stop. The need to understand to unravel this mystery was overwhelming. I placed the next tape into the recorder. Its label, number two. New cataclysms, a harbinger of further revelations. With a mix of trepidation and an unyielding need for answers, I pressed play. The tape hissed to life and once again, my voice, or the voice of someone who shared it, filled the room. After the earthquake that struck all over the world, nations were draped in mourning. Our country, like many others, was steeped in a somber reflection that transcended borders. The voice on the tape intoned, a spectral echo of my own. I stayed by Abby's side the whole time. The voice continued, its cadence a mirror to my own emotions. Watching her in that hospital bed, grappling with the loss of part of her arm, was a trial of its own. The sight of her, so resilient, yet so profoundly affected, was a constant reminder of the fragility of our existence. The voice spoke of the world's wounds, not just the physical scars etched into landscapes, but the deeper, more pervasive injuries inflicted upon the collective human spirit. The tragedies didn't stop with the earthquake. Tsunamis began to batter coastal cities around the globe. Small towns, once havens of tranquility, were obliterated by the relentless waves. Thousands were rendered homeless, their lives uprooted as mercilessly as the structures they once called home. There was a gravity to the words, a solemnity that transcended the mere recounting of events. Survivors spoke of premonitions, strange sounds preceding the tsunamis, an auditory harbinger of the chaos to come. The voice narrated, a note of intrigue seeping into the somber recitation. I found myself leaning in, drawn to the mystery interwoven with the calamity. At first, I thought this all to be a temporary phenomenon, the voice admitted, a confession that mirrored my own initial disbelief. Natural disasters happen, ebb and flow in their own cruel rhythm, but the scope, the frequency, it was unlike anything we had known. The voice grew more contemplative, introspective. I was wrong to think it would soon be over. The reports grew more frequent, more urgent. Social media and news networks were abuzz with accounts of people hearing strange sounds in the sky, a phenomenon that defied explanation, stirring a disquiet deep within those who witnessed it. A personal memory surfaced as the tape played on. I too experienced this, the voice said, drawing me back to a moment etched in my mind. Returning from the hospital one evening, the sky above was an expanse of deepening twilight. The narrative on the tape resumed, a continuation of a tale that seemed both mine and not. By the way, our house was not damaged by the earthquake. My voice narrated, a tone of subdued relief per meeting the words. Of course he had staggered under the seismic dance, but stood resilient, 
A beacon amidst the Chaos, it was one of the few in the neighborhood that weathered the Earth's wrath on Skathed. So there I was, driving home that night, the voice continued, my mind a tumult of thoughts, reflections on the day's harrowing events swirling in my head. The radio was my only companion, a familiar presence in the car's enclosed space. But tranquility was fleeting. Suddenly the radio began to falter, its steady stream of news and music giving way to static. I watched as the night lights flickered, a stroboscopic dance that preluded darkness. And then, as if in sympathy with the failing lights, the car's engine sputtered and died, a mechanical heart ceasing to beat. The description was vivid, pulling me into the moment. There I was, stranded in the middle of the road, the car a lifeless hulk beneath my hands. With an effort that seemed monumental, I managed to steer it to a stop, avoiding the calamity of an accident in the consuming darkness. Emerging from the car, I found I was not alone. Others had stopped as well, their vehicles rendered inert by the same mysterious affliction. We stood there, a congregation of the stranded, under a sky blanketed with winter clouds. And then, cutting through the night, came a sound. A long, ominous rumble, strange and frightening, a sonic enigma that seemed to emanate from the very heavens. The voice on the tape captured the essence of that moment. The hum continued for a few seconds, then repeated itself, a pattern emerging in its eerie cadence. It was akin to the muffled scraping of metal, a sound both alien and terrifying. We, the witnesses, stood transfixed, a collective shock binding us in the shared experience of the inexplicable. I could almost feel the fear and wonder of that moment. Beside me, someone began to pray, their words a whispered plea in the face of the unknown. I remained motionless, caught in a daze, the surreal nature of the situation rendering me immobile, a statue bearing witness to the world's unspoken mysteries. The voice grew contemplative. After a few minutes, the rumbling ceased, as abruptly as it had begun. The nightlights flickered back to life, a hesitant return to normalcy. And then with a cough and a splutter, my car's engine revived, a mechanical resurrection that seemed almost miraculous. I sat back, the tape recorder silent now, its story told. Those few minutes of rumbling, as described by the voice, were just the beginning. A harbinger of changes, of events that defied understanding. Turning off the tape recorder, I found myself adrift in a sea of questions, each more perplexing than the last. The sound that had filled the night sky, the origin of the tapes, the unsettling familiarity of the voice, all these mysteries coalesced into a puzzle that gnawed at the edges of my understanding. Sitting in the dim light of our living room, the remnants of Abby's earlier presence still lingering like a ghost, I pondered the next course of action. Determination settled upon me like a mantle. I needed to find the previous owners of the house, to unearth the origins of the tapes that had so inexplicably become a part of my life. Reaching for my phone, I dialed the realtor, fabricating a story about important memorabilia left behind in the garage. My voice was steady, belying the tumultuous sea of thoughts within. The realtor, however, remained resolute in his refusal to divulge the previous owner's contact details, citing privacy and policy. His words, a well-rehearsed barrier to my inquiries, left me with a sense of frustration. After the call, I was left with no choice but to wait, hope dangling by the thin thread of the realtor's promise to contact the previous owners himself. The uncertainty was a bitter companion, one that fed the growing sense of unease within me. In an effort to distract myself, I returned to the tapes. My hand hesitated over the next one, Labalid number three. Fouts in Antarctica. The tittle alone was a siren call to my curiosity, promising revelations of a world shifting beneath our feet. I pressed play, the click of the button a definitive sound in the stillness of the room. The power outages were becoming more frequent, the internet increasingly unreliable. The world outside was becoming a distant memory, its events fading into insignificance against the backdrop of personal concerns. Abby's recovery, her well-being, eclipsed all else. In the dimly lit room I sat, the tape recorder my only companion in the growing isolation. It was only sporadically that I tuned into the news, the world's events filtering through in fragmented bursts, 
and in one such instance, I learned of the seismic shifts reaching even to Antarctica. Faults, vast and deep, had torn through the icy wilderness, a testament to the upheaval that had gripped the planet. The voice described a world unraveling, its secrets laid bare by the relentless march of change. The news spoke of glaciers melting at a record pace, releasing gases trapped for millennia. These emissions, they said, were a cocktail of elements and compounds, some known, others a mystery to our current understanding. I listened, a sense of foreboding growing within me. A scientist, his name a tangle of syllables, spoke of the glaciers as archives of the Earth's past, layers upon layers of ice, each a record of the atmosphere's history, containing aerosols, dust, and ancient microorganisms. And among these, gases, some potentially harmful, possibly even lethal to human life. The narrative took a turn towards the ominous. The scientist warned of the risks, of diseases long dormant now stirring with the thawing ice, epidemics born from the bowels of the earth, a threat emerging from the depths of time. His words, a harbinger of a new kind of catastrophe, one born from the very air we breathe. I sat there, skepticism battling with the growing realization that the world was changing in ways we could scarcely comprehend. I listened to the scientists' warnings with my usual skepticism. Such proclamations were common among the scientific community, often sensational, a clamor for attention in a world inundated with information. The voice grew introspective, but in my heart I knew that this time my skepticism might be misplaced. The world was showing us, in no uncertain terms, that it harbored secrets beyond our understanding, forces that we had awakened in our ignorance and arrogance. As the final words of the third tape faded into silence, the phone's ring shattered the quietude of the room, a jarring intrusion into my thoughts. The realtor's voice, when I answered, was a mixture of apology and frustration. I'm sorry, Jonathan. I've tried, but I can't find the former owners. They've simply vanished. I pressed him, a sense of urgency lacing my words. Please, it's important. You must have some way to contact them. The realtor's reluctance was palpable, even through the phone. I've been searching for them myself, even before your call. They took a private flight to some islands and... They never arrived. They're missing, Jonathan. Presumed lost at sea. The news hit me like a physical blow, a wave of shock that left me reeling. The former owners of the house, the possible originators of the tapes, now just another mystery in a world that seemed to grow more enigmatic by the day. Hanging up, I found myself adrift in a sea of confusion and fear. The tapes, with their eerie narration of a world in upheaval, now took on an even more ominous tone. The disappearance of the house's previous occupants added layers of questions to an already unfathomable mystery. With a heavy heart, I decided to set the box of tapes aside. There were other matters that needed tending, wounds of a more personal nature that required healing. Abby, with her pragmatic strength and unwavering presence, was my anchor in the storm that was brewing both within and without. I found her in the sleeping room, the evening light casting long shadows on the walls. Abby, I began, my voice tinged with the weight of my revelations. I need to talk to you about something important. She looked up, her expression one of concern. I told her everything, the mysterious box of tapes, the strange and unsettling stories they contained, the disappearance of the previous owners. I laid bare my fears, my belief in the reality of the tape's narratives. It's all true, Abby, I concluded, a desperate plea for understanding in my voice. This isn't a joke or a prank. There's something happening, something beyond our understanding. Abby listened, her expression shifting from skepticism to a dawning realization of the depth of my distress. Jonathan, she said softly, you're letting these tapes get to you. Let me listen to one. I want to understand why you're so upset. With a mixture of reluctance and hope, I retrieved the tape recorder. The cassette tape labeled Number Four, The Sickness of the Beginning of the End, felt heavier than the rest as I slotted it into the tape recorder. Abby sat beside me, a silent sentinel in our shared journey into the unknown. The click of the play button was a solemn sound, a harbinger of the revelations to come. My voice, weary and tinged with sadness, filled the room. The earthquakes, relentless in their fury, continued to tear the earth asunder. 
Tsunamis followed in their wake, leaving behind a trail of destruction that defied comprehension. Cities, once bustling centers of life, lay in ruins, their victims countless, their stories untold. The narrative painted a grim picture of a world in chaos, a landscape marred by natural calamities of an unprecedented scale. The internet, our window to the world, ceased to function, cutting us off from the global community. And then, as if to add to our woes, forest fires forced our town's evacuation. We found ourselves among the displaced, our home a memory, our lives reduced to existence in a tent city. I felt Abby's hand find mine, a wordless gesture of solidarity as the voice recounted our ordeal. It was there, amidst the sea of tents and the faces of the dispossessed, that Abby fell ill. An unknown disease, virulent and unforgiving, swept through the makeshift community like a plague. It was a pandemic, its reach and lethality surpassing even the coronavirus of years past. The voice, my voice, spoke of hospitals overrun, of doctors overwhelmed and succumbing to the very illness they fought to cure. I remember the desperation, the sense of helplessness as I watched Abby battle the sickness. The doctors, in their tireless efforts, found that I was immune, a rare anomaly in a sea of susceptibility. But my immunity was a small comfort, for it offered no solace to Abby, no respite from her suffering. The tape wove a tale of a world gripped by an unseen enemy, a disease that respected no borders, acknowledged no barriers. Information was scarce, the absence of the internet a void that was hard to fill. But piece by piece I gathered the fragments of knowledge that were available. Scientists had warned us, their voices lost in the cacophony of daily life, that the Earth's upheavals, the faults and melting glaciers, were not mere natural phenomena. They were harbingers of a deeper malaise, one that had now manifested in a pandemic. I listened, a sense of dread growing within me. The first victims, it seemed, were animals, reindeer to be precise. The disease, once a benign presence in their midst, had mutated, crossed the species barrier, and found a new host in humanity. They called it the zombie virus, a name that belied the horror it inflicted upon those it touched. Abby's grip on my hand tightened as the voice continued. The virus spread, its tendrils reaching far and wide, claiming lives with a ruthless efficiency. Hospitals became tombs, doctors the harbingers of grim news. The world, already reeling from the environmental catastrophes, now had to contend with a threat that lurked within, invisible yet deadly. Abby's fingers trembled as she stopped the tape, her actions an unspoken admission of the fear that gripped us both. She returned from the adjacent room, her phone screen casting a pale light in the dim room, revealing an article that seemed to echo the grim reality the tapes had narrated. An epidemic of zombie deer disease is spreading in Yellowstone, and scientists fear it could spread to humans, the headline read, its words a chilling parallel to the tapes' prophecy. The room, our haven from the world's chaos, felt suddenly oppressive, the air thick with unspoken terror. Abby's eyes, wide with fear, met mine. Jonathan, this is too real, she whispered, her voice a thin thread in the silence. I struggled to find words, to piece together the fractured narrative that had been unfolding. The global earthquakes, the tsunamis, the melting glaciers, all had set in motion a catastrophic chain of events. The world was in the grip of an energy and economic crisis, the internet and modern communication a failing memory. And now, the pandemic, a disease born from ancient perils released into the atmosphere, was claiming lives with indiscriminate ferocity. Abby sat beside me, her presence a grounding force in the maelstrom of my thoughts. We need to understand this, to prepare, I said, my voice steadier than I felt. The primal fear that had taken root in my heart urged me forward, seeking answers in the only source we had, the tapes. The cassette titled Number Five, the end was an artifact of despair, its label a grim premonition. As I pressed play, the voice that emanated from the speakers was mine. Yet it was strained, distorted by illness and weariness. I saw flashes in the sky, it began, a cough punctuating the words. The world has fallen silent, the rumble of an unseen terror the only constant in this new reality. The earthquakes have ceased, their fury spent. Now we huddle near the power plant, 
a small community clinging to the vestiges of civilization. We are but a few thousand, the remnants of a world that once teemed with billions. The narrative painted a picture of a world transformed, its familiar contours warped into something unrecognizable. We are cut off, isolated from the rest of humanity. Governments, militaries, the structures that once governed our lives are now just memories, whispers of a past that seems like a dream. I felt a kinship with the voice, its despair mirroring my own. Our days are spent in vigilance, defending against the mutated remnants of humanity and wildlife, victims of the zombie virus. The walls we have erected are our only defense, but they are temporary, a fragile barrier against the encroaching darkness. The voice spoke of the community's leader, an ex-military man who understood the futility of our situation. He speaks of leaving, of finding a new refuge. But where can we go in a world that offers no sanctuary? The people are afraid, their spirits broken by the relentless tide of change. As the tape continued, my voice grew softer, introspective. I am sick, the virus coursing through my veins, a constant reminder of my mortality. I think of Abby, of the life we could have had. The regrets, the what-ifs, they haunt me. Ghosts of choices not made, warnings not heeded. The voice choked with emotion. I keep a picture of Abby with me, a tangible memory of a love that once was. It is my talisman, a beacon in the encroaching gloom. I wonder in these final moments if there is any strength left in me to face the days ahead. The tape ended abruptly, its final words hanging in the air, a testament to a journey cut short. I sat there, the recorder silent, the weight of the narrative pressing down on me. The room with the Christmas tree and the flickering light of the fireplace seemed like a refuge from the chaos the tapes told me about. But everything was about to change. The new year was irreversibly upon us.